As we begin episode two of Lost Flight MH370, let me throw out a fundamental caveat to caution. Though we will stick to the known facts as a foundation for our investigation, it will become necessary for us to hypothesize or speculate the unknowns in order to build an algorithm that seems to connect the dots in some logical fashion. As a matter of principle, I will stick to Occam's razor as a method of tackling the numerous points of bifurcating hypotheticals that will present themselves along our journey into the mystery of flight MH370. Occam's razor, basically stated, is given the choice between a varied set of hypotheticals, the one that makes the least assumptions most likely presents the best answer. Let me add, there is no doubt the loss of Malaysia Flight 370 is filled with controversy and great personal pain to many. Any algorithm presented will be subject to skepticism and justifiably so. Even the discovery of the lost aircraft itself may not answer all questions. That being said, let's begin constructing our algorithm. Finding a point to begin our algorithm is problematic. Prior to the takeoff of MH370 early on the morning of March 8, 2014, there already existed a set of circumstances that would ultimately seal the fate of the flight. What those pre-existing circumstances were goes to the heart of the mystery, yet at the same time seem the most treacherous to speculation. The simplest solution seems to be to start with the takeoff of Malaysia Flight 370 and follow the timeline. As we move along the timeline of the flight, we will examine each anomaly. At each anomalous point, we will attempt to find the most logical step forward in constructing a satisfying algorithm. The first 39 minutes of the flight seem perfectly normal to all outward appearances. It's after this 39th minute moving forward that everything goes sideways. At Malaysia time 0121, 39 minutes into the flight, MH370's transponder stops functioning. The plane no longer appears on air traffic control secondary radar. The last verbal contact with the plane was at 0119 Malaysia time with Captain Zahari Ahmad Shah's sign off to Malaysia air traffic control of this loss of signal from the transponder is the first and most fundamental anomaly. We will spend quite a bit of time investigating this point in the flight as it is the pivot on which all else turns. There are three points of interest that we must take into account at this first anomaly in the flight timeline. One, was the transponder turned off by a human agent or did it fail due to malfunction? This is our first point of bifurcation in moving forward with our algorithm, design, or a malfunction. Two, the transponder goes offline just as the aircraft is transiting from the air traffic control region of Malaysia to the air traffic control region of Vietnam. Was this by design or a coincidence of misfortune? A fundamental bifurcation in constructing a reasonable algorithm. And three, the aircraft almost immediately deviates from its planned flight path and flies along a route that takes it back across the Malay Peninsula. Why? Again, by design or a response to an onboard emergency precipitated by malfunction. We will move forward by investigating each possibility, malfunction or human design. Before we start constructing our algorithm, let's take a look at an overview of those points along the timeline that the algorithm must take into account. The term algorithm as I am using it here, is simply a set of steps or methodology by which a problem can be solved. In our case, we will construct an algorithm with the goal of arriving at a satisfactory answer as to what happened aboard lost flight MH370, leading to the loss of the aircraft and all aboard. As stated earlier, we will begin this process by taking a look at the flight timeline. We need to have a clear understanding of the knowns moving forward. This will give us a framework within which we can interpolate or extrapolate the unknowns. We are going to break the flight timeline into two parts. 
The entire flight of MH370 from takeoff to the last transmission from MH370's SDU lasted about 7 hours and 37 minutes. We will primarily concern ourselves with the first two hours of the flight, leaving the last 5 hours and 37 minutes for future analysis. The first two hours contain the details which will be most pertinent in constructing our algorithm. Let's begin by taking a quick look at an animated presentation of the first two hours of the flight with some key points noted. Let's now begin a concentrated look at the first two hours of the timeline of the flight of MH370. We will start with an overview of the most salient points. Flight MH370 takes off from the Kuala Lumpur International Airport at 0042 Malaysia time on March 8, 2014. This would be 1642 UTC, that is Universal Time, on March 7, 2014. At 19 minutes into the flight, the captain of flight MH370, Zahari Ahmad Shah, informs Kuala Lumpur Air Traffic Control that flight MH370 has reached flight level 350 or 35,000 feet. At 25 minutes into the flight, at 1707 UTC, the last acknowledged ground-to-air Data 2 ACARS message between the Inmarsat Satellite Communications Network and MH370's SDU or Satellite Data Unit takes place. This begins a period from 1707 to 1803 UTC or from 25 to 81 minutes into the flight, sometime during which the data link between the Inmarsat ground station and MH370's SDU is lost. Exactly at what point during this time period the data link went offline is uncertain. The Inmarsat data logs only show a positive data link response at 1707 UTC and a negative response at 1803 UTC. The SATCOM link is not re-established until 1825 UTC or 103 minutes into the flight when MH370's SDU comes back online and transmits a logon request to the Inmarsat satellite network at 1825 UTC. How and why the SDU went offline and came back online will be of key importance in constructing our algorithm. At 37 minutes into the flight, Kuala Lumpur Air Traffic Control instructs flight MH370 to contact Ho Chi Minh Air Traffic Control. Flight MH370 is passing Waypoint Agari, leaving the Kuala Lumpur Flight Information Region and entering the Ho Chi Minh Flight Information Region. Captain Zahari Ahmad Shah signs off contact with Kuala Lumpur Air Traffic Control with This is the last verbal contact with Flight MH370. At 39 minutes into the flight, MH370's transponder goes offline. The flight MH370 secondary radar display symbol disappears from air traffic control secondary radar screens in Kuala Lumpur and Ho Chi Minh. MH370 has now become a lost flight. 
Malaysian military radar continuing to track MH370, though with no active interest at the time, shows MH370 almost immediately making a turn back toward the Malay Peninsula at 39 minutes into the flight or 0121 Malaysia time. With the loss of MH370's transponder signal, a period of confusion begins among the concerned air traffic control centers as to the status of flight MH370. A series of queries concerning the status of MH370 are exchanged between Ho Chi Minh and Kuala Lumpur Air Traffic Control Centers and the Malaysia Airlines Operations Center over the next several hours. At approximately 48 minutes into the flight of MH370, Ho Chi Minh makes a request to the pilots of an aircraft in the supposed vicinity of MH370 to attempt contact with the unresponsive plane. The pilots of the responding aircraft replying back to Ho Chi Minh, report only hearing mumbling and static from their attempt to contact flight MH370. At this same 48 minute time point, Malaysian military radar shows that MH370 is now on a magnetic heading of 231, flying at a ground speed of 496 knots at an altitude of 35,700 feet, heading back toward the Malay Peninsula. At 70 minutes into the flight, Malaysian military radar has flight MH370's position as being just south of Penang Island off the west coast of the Malay Peninsula. At 81 minutes into the flight, Malaysian military radar has flight MH370's position as being over the small island of Palau Perak in the Straits of Malacca. At 100 minutes into the flight at 0222 Malaysia time, Malaysian military radar loses contact with MH370 10 nautical miles beyond Aviation Waypoint, Mekar. At 103 minutes into the flight at 0225 Malaysia time, MH370's SDU, or Satellite Data Unit, comes back online with a logon request sent to the Inmarsat Satellite Communications Network. At 117 minutes into the flight, a ground-to-aircraft satellite phone call from the Malaysia Airlines Operations Center to MH370 goes unanswered. We will end our look at the first two hours of the timeline of the flight of MH370 here. We will examine the last five hours and 37 minutes of the flight later in the construction of our algorithm. We now want to begin a critical analysis of the period of the flight timeline from the 19 minute mark into the flight to the 39 minute mark. It is this 20 minute time span which will be the most crucial in constructing our algorithm. We now want to begin an examination of the 20 minute time span from 19 minutes into the flight to the 39 minute mark. At times, we will reference events in the flight timeline outside this crucial 20-minute period as these outlying events will impact our algorithm. The focus and purpose of our examination will be to begin constructing the algorithm. Let's take a look at a branching model of the algorithmic potentialities that lie before us. We start with the flight timeline at 0000, elapsed flight time. We move forward to the 0039 minute mark into the flight. This is where a bifurcation event, an anomaly, creates a branching in our algorithmic possibilities. Whatever happened aboard MH370 to change the flight from a routine trip to Beijing, China to becoming one of the greatest aviation mysteries of all time comes to a climax at the 39 minute mark with MH370's transponder going offline. Our task in constructing our algorithm is to attempt to figure out what went wrong at this 39 minute mark. As our algorithmic model shows, we have two basic lines of pursuit moving forward, malfunction or human intervention. Along the malfunction line of pursuit, we have the possibilities of fire, electrical malfunction or a cabin pressurization event. Along the human intervention line of pursuit, we have the possibility of some form of nefarious intervention by either a passenger, a cabin crew member, or one of the two pilots. These will be the algorithmic potentialities we will explore moving forward. 
At this point, let me digress for a moment to address the limitations of the algorithm for those who may think my model is too limited in scope. As stated at the beginning of this presentation, we will stick to Occam's razor in constructing our algorithm. That is to say, the simplest answers are usually the best. This eliminates such algorithmic lines of pursuit as alien abduction of the aircraft, the aircraft being swallowed up by a time war, or the aircraft being spirited off to some remote location by some mysterious military entity. All of these theories, while intriguing, ignore the basic known facts about the flight. We will best serve ourselves and our investigation by staying grounded and on point as we move forward. That being said, let's begin our examination of the algorithmic lines of pursuit that will lead us to an answer as to what happened aboard flight MH370 on that fateful day of March 8, 2014. We have our two basic lines of pursuit moving forward, malfunction or human intervention. We are going to start our algorithmic journey by pursuing the malfunction potentialities as being the cause of the loss of flight MH370. The first item we will investigate is the possibility of an onboard fire being the root cause of the loss of the flight. Over the course of aviation history, various types of in-flight fires have led to disastrous outcomes on over 40-plus flights. We will examine a few of the most pertinent cases and see how they compare to the events surrounding MH370. Let me say from the start here that the fact MH370 flew on for some seven hours after the 39-minute mark seems to make an onboard fire look unlikely. Flight statistics indicate that, on average, a flight crew has about 17 minutes to safely land an aircraft after an onboard fire has been detected. There is also the glaring fact that from the sign-off by Captain Shaw to MH370's transponder going offline, only about 1 minute and 47 seconds elapse, as we can see from our graphic. After the transponder goes offline, the aircraft almost immediately begins a course change back toward the Malay Peninsula. No distress call is issued. No apparent attempt is made to contact air traffic control for flight vectors or emergency landing clearance. But what might seem improbable cannot be taken as impossible. A few aviation experts early in the disappearance of flight MH370 had championed the idea that an onboard fire could have led to the loss of the flight. Chris Goodfellow, a pilot with 20 years of experience, proposed that an onboard fire led the pilots of MH370 to divert course. Goodfellow hypothesized that with an onboard fire beginning to spread through the aircraft, the pilots attempted to divert back toward the airfield at Palalangkawi, which had a 13,000-foot runway. But after altering course, the onboard fire melted electronic wiring bundles, leading to the release of cyanide gas throughout the cockpit and passenger cabin. Oxygen mass would have been no protection against cyanide gas as it can enter through the skin and lead to unconsciousness. An electrical fire would also have led to the loss of electric circuits either by destruction or by the pilots pulling circuit breakers in the attempt to stop the progress of the fire. The loss of electrical power would also have taken the aircraft's transponder offline. Thus, with the fire event leading to the loss of the aircraft's electrical systems, including communication and crucial avionics systems, and with the crew and passengers incapacitated, flight MH370 flew on until its fuel was exhausted. This theory was among several different fire scenarios hypothesized by various aviation experts during the early days of speculation concerning the loss of MH370. The fact that MH370 was carrying lithium-ion batteries in its cargo hold led some experts to propose that this potentially hazardous cargo could have been a possible ignition source for an onboard fire. Flight MH370 was carrying, among its cargo items, 221 kilograms or 487 pounds of lithium-ion batteries. The batteries manufactured by Motorola Solutions Penang were bound for Beijing, China. 
From January 2014 to May 2014, there had been 99 shipments of lithium-ion batteries aboard Malaysia Airlines flights bound for China. No incidents relating to the battery shipments had been reported. If we look at this diagram of the MH370 Boeing aircraft, we can see the locations of the Motorola shipments within MH370's forward and rear cargo holds. The batteries were part of a larger Motorola shipment weighing in at 2,453 kilograms. Let's now continue our line of pursuit down the algorithmic path of fire by looking into a tragic fire aboard a UPS flight out of Dubai caused by lithium-ion batteries carried in the aircraft's cargo hold. We want to see if this in-flight fire incident can give us any insight into the loss of flight MH370. On September 3, 2010, UPS Flight 6 departed the Dubai International Airport bound for Cologne, Germany. The aircraft was a Boeing 747-400F, a cargo flight with only the pilot and co-pilot aboard. The pilots were 48-year-old Captain Douglas Lampy out of Louisville, Kentucky, and 38-year-old First Officer Matthew Bell out of Sanford, Florida. Let's now begin a run-through of the timeline of UPS Flight 6. We want to see what we can learn from the documented timeline of UPS Flight 6 that can be applied to the loss of Flight MH370. UPS Flight 6 departed the Dubai International Airport from runway 30 right at 1451 UTC. This would have been 6.51 p.m. local time. At 1511 UTC, about 20 minutes into the flight, UPS Flight 6 contacts Bahrain Air Traffic Control as it is transiting from the United Arab Emirates Flight Information Region to the Bahrain Flight Information Region. At 151258 UTC, about 22 minutes into the flight, an alert goes off in the cockpit. Fire, main deck forward. At 151314 UTC, Captain Lampy contacts Bahrain ATC with, just got a fire indication on the main deck, a need to land ASAP. Bahrain ATC offers Captain Lampy the closest airfield, located at Doha, Qatar, about 100 nautical miles away from the aircraft's current location. Captain Lampy elects to attempt the return to Dubai International Airport, which is about 180 nautical miles away. At 151331 per Bahrain ATC, the pilots select a change in heading from 295 to 090 on the mode control panel for the turn back to Dubai International Airport. At 1515 UTC, both pilots don supplemental oxygen masks. There are initially communication issues between the two pilots after putting on the oxygen mass, but they are able to resolve the issues. By 1517 UTC, the cockpit has filled with dense smoke to the degree that the pilots cannot see their flight instruments, nor can they see out of the cockpit windows. They are flying blind. At about 1520 UTC, 29 minutes into the flight, Captain Lampy indicates to First Officer Bell that his oxygen mask is not providing oxygen. Captain Lampy can't breathe. Lampy turns flight control of the aircraft over to First Officer Bell. Lampy leaves his flight seat and attempts to reach a secondary emergency oxygen supply in the area just aft of the cockpit, but he passes out and never regains consciousness. At 1522 UTC, First Officer Bell informs Bahrain ATC that the smoke in the cockpit is so dense he can't see the flight instruments. He is unable to change the radio frequency to the Dubai ATC frequency for communication purposes as he cannot see the audio control panel. He has to remain dependent on Bahrain ATC. But as UPS Flight 6 flies back toward Dubai, it flies out of radio range with Bahrain ATC. It becomes necessary for Bahrain ATC to relay communications through other aircraft in the area in order to communicate with UPS Flight 6. From 1522 UTC to 1537 UTC, First Officer Bell is struggling to save the aircraft. He is flying blind in a cockpit filled with toxic smoke. He cannot see his instruments. 
He cannot see out of the plane's cockpit windows. He struggles to communicate with the relay aircraft in Bahrain ATC. Dubai ATC attempts to transmit several advisory messages to UPS Flight 6. Dubai attempts to inform the inbound flight that it has been cleared for any available runway. At 1538 UTC, 47 minutes into the flight, the struggling aircraft misses its approach to the Dubai International Airport as it comes in too high and too fast. At 1539 UTC, after the missed approach, UPS Flight 6 is offered an alternative landing site at nearby Sarja Airfield. A relay aircraft advises First Officer Bell that his new heading will be 095 degrees. Bell acknowledges the new heading, but due to dire conditions in the cockpit and his own deteriorating condition, Bell airs and selects 195 degrees on the mode control panel of the aircraft. This causes the aircraft to turn right when it needed to turn left in the direction of the Sarja airfield. At 154133 UTC, the crash investigators hear from the recovered cockpit voice recorder the ground proximity warning system alerting the pilot to pull up, pull up. At 154135 UTC, data recording from the recovered cockpit voice recorder ends. The plane has made an uncontrolled descent into terrain near the Nad El Shaba military base, about nine nautical miles southwest of the Dubai International Airport. The two pilots are the only casualties. No one on the ground is injured. In the following accident investigation, lithium-ion batteries in the forward cargo hold area of the aircraft were the suspected source of ignition that started the fatal fire. I think there are at least several takeaways from the UPS Flight 6 incident which we can juxtapose against Flight MH370. When confronted with the fire alarms, the pilots of UPS Flight 6 had within a minute declared an emergency situation to Bahrain ATC and requested return to the Dubai airfield. Even with a cockpit shrouded in dense smoke, the pilots were able to communicate with Bahrain ATC, though with some difficulty. In the case of Flight MH370, no emergency declaration is transmitted to Kuala Lumpur or Ho Chi Minh. UPS Flight 6 remained flying for about 29 minutes after the fire warnings went off in the cockpit. MH370, after the transponder went offline, remained flying for about 7 hours, made several course changes, and had its SDU, which had gone offline, come back online. If electrical circuits or the SDU itself had been damaged in a fire, how did it come back online at 1 hour and 43 minutes into the flight? Aboard UPS Flight 6, we only had the two pilots isolated in the cockpit. Aboard MH370, we had two pilots, 10 cabin crew members, and 227 passengers. Smoke or even the smell of burning materials manifesting anywhere in the passenger cabin would have been noticed and reported right away. It's difficult to believe any kind of fire event could have overtaken MH370 without some notice to those aboard so as to allow time for the pilots to contact either Kuala Lumpur ATC or Ho Chi Minh ATC. But as I noted earlier, what seems improbable is not necessarily impossible. In episode 3, we will continue our pursuit down the malfunction line of fire. We will look at other examples of fires on board aircraft and see how their outcome compares to Flight MH370.